Good afternoon, everybody. Or if you're listening, zooming in from the other side of the world, good morning or good evening. And welcome to the session on employee ownership. We hope you enjoyed the day so far. My name is Jeremy Gadd, and I'm the founder and managing director of Gadd Associates. And we help organizations lever the advantage and move into employee ownership. So very much a uh, topic of conversation for today. And I'm really pleased to welcome uh, a, a broad panel um, of uh, Deb Oxley, who is the CEO of the Employee Owners Association. Uh, and she's going to give a really interesting uh, presentation on why employee ownership not only matters, but is so important at this moment in time. Uh, and to David Roxton, who is the founder, co-founder of Ardman Animations, uh, who many of you will have heard of, and they became employee owned uh, some 18 months ago. Uh, and he's going to give his uh, account of their real life transition, what worked, why they did it, uh, and some of the challenges. And then we've got uh, an expert panel to help us as well, to guide us through some of the questions that you'll no doubt have. Uh, ben Watson from TLT and Simon Christian from uh, Trados Bank. Um, and uh, myself can help on some of the, 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 the questions that you may have on how you actually bring employee ownership to life. So without further ado, I'll just ask each person to introduce themselves briefly, and then we will hand over to Deb Oxley, who's going to talk about employee ownership. Um, Deb, would you just like to introduce yourself briefly? Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, as Jeremy said. Uh, my name's Deb Oxley. I'm the chief executive of the membership organisation in the UK for businesses that are either transitioning to employee ownership or are employee owned. That's the Employee Ownership Association. Um, Jeremy, do you want to me, me to ask, answer this question as well that you set us all, which is what am I looking forward about on today? Thank you, yes. Um, so uh, today I think it's really exciting because um, whilst the benefits of employee ownership are universal, um, and since I've been involved in this sector for the last eight years, um, I've seen these benefits in all sorts of different circumstances. The world is changing. It's, it's responding to crisis and opportunity. So I'm, what I'm really looking forward to is hearing new perspectives and views about where employee ownership might fit in society and the economy in the future. Thanks. Brilliant. Thanks, Deb. And thank you for reminding me of the questions that I will send you. Um, so, uh, David, if you briefly introduce yourself and also answer the question, what you're looking through from this afternoon's session. Thank you. Hello, I'm, I'm David Froxton, co-founder of Ardman Animations, the company that brings you Wallace and Gromit, Sean the Sheep, Morph, um, films like Chicken Run, so uh, the company was formed over 40 years ago. And when I say it's a company, it was really just a partnership of Pitt Lord and myself, which kind of grew like topsy over the years. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. What am I looking forward to? I think the same as Deb's. I think it's interesting in the what will be the post-COVID society, how we get a better uh, set of values into companies, if that will happen. Um, I think we've seen a lot of... Um, collaboration and cooperation at the street level and neighborhood level. And at that, if you could expand that into corporate level, I think that would be very interesting. And I'm just interested to hear people's questions and to learn something new. Thank you, David. Uh, and Ben, over to yourself. Uh, uh, a, bit, a brief introduction to yourself and what you're looking to, to uh, from this afternoon. Thanks, Jeremy. And um, yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Ben Watson, and I'm a partner at TLT Solicitors. and we advise all sorts of companies actually on the legal and tax elements and some of the project management elements of moving towards uh, employee ownership and that's whether actually uh, companies are at an early stage just thinking about it and thinking about the whys and wherefores of doing it or actually also companies that have been employee owned for some time and are looking uh, for advice on how to perhaps uh, do things in a different way uh, we've been lucky enough to act for all sorts of companies actually, uh, including Ardman, worked alongside David for many years on the transition to employee ownership. Um, what am I looking forward to today? Well, I'm always interested in talking about employee ownership with, with new and wider audiences and in helping uh, with the others on the panel demystify a little bit what employee ownership is all about. Um, and as David mentioned, um, hearing from other people as to their questions and their own experiences of EO. So, yeah, really excited to participate. Thank you. 
Brilliant. Thank you, Ben. And always good to have things deep but that'll be good. Simon, uh, and finally yourself. Uh, good afternoon. Yes, my name is Simon Crichton. I'm from Triodos Bank. I look after their um, business banking team here in the UK. And if you think about Triodos in terms of uh, financing change and its positive impact, um, obviously employee ownership is one of those impacts that we see a great opportunity in terms of better equity for the employee uh, within the workspace. And so we've been financing similar organisations for many years now, whether it be in the cooperative world, but uh, increasingly getting inquiries about and financing employee ownership trusts and uh, a variety of uh, different uh, models. So I'll be looking forward to today and hearing more about it ourselves and learning more ourselves. We are still early in our journey. That's lovely. Thank you very, very much, Simon. And myself, I'm just looking forward to hopefully making this small first of all think it might turn off your microphones and cameras and then we'll hand over to deb uh thanks deb thanks Thank jeremy you. um you're just cutting out a little bit actually jeremy so um hopefully we can get that addressed um so uh what i guess i want to just cover is what is employee ownership um and why it's important right now as jeremy said so um, i'm sure many of you out there are familiar with different forms of business ownership and you might be wondering whether or not employee ownership is cooperatives is it social enterprises is it b corps well no it's none of those things but it can be all of those things so employee ownership um is exists when a business is able to offer all of its employees an opportunity to have a stake and that can either be in the form of uh, shares or it can be um, when uh, there is a trust in play and all the employees are beneficiaries of it so everybody gets the same opportunity to have a stake and importantly that stake is combined with a collection a collective um, opportunity to have a say so that collective voice of all of those employees is then um, able to be had in some form of democracy some form of governance within the organization which often manifests itself with an employee representative on the board or an employee director on a trust um, and probably an employee forum or an employee council so that's what employee ownership is um, it's not a cooperative, although you can have worker co-ops, of course. Most cooperatives, many of them are owned by their consumers. Um, a worker co-op um, is owned by the employees, but it is a different structure of ownership to employee ownership. So that's what it is. Um, and I think what it really delivers is that combination of having a stake and a say. So there's a structure of ownership where you share the ownership out in a stake. And there's a culture of ownership where you bring that ownership stake to life through the voice of the employees. And, and that's what you will see in every and any employee ownership business that you might be aware of. Um, we know, of course, Ardman are on the panel and David's business or the business that David and Peter established is now an employee owned business. So it will have those same features, as does the biggest employee owned business that everybody is aware of in the UK, the John Lewis Partnership and every other business in between. So so why employee ownership? Um, well, having spent eight years in this sector, I would say because it unleashes the power of ownership. And when somebody owns something, they act differently. And you've only got to think about yourself. If you own a car or you own a property or you own anything, it's yours. You take care of it. You are proud of it. You commit to it. You care for it. And that's quite different to simply using something that, that doesn't really belong to you and you don't really have that sense of ownership. So that unleashing that sense of ownership then also unleashes what I would say is a sense of stewardship. And that stewardship is about protecting that thing, that place, that asset, in this case, that business for the long term. So that's why employee ownership really draws out the very best in employees and it draws out the very best in business. So where would you see employee ownership? You'll see it across the UK. 
um, in over 500 businesses that are employing around 20,000, uh, sorry, 200,000 people. Um, it's across every sector of the economy. I don't think there's a bit of the economy that we haven't found yet that doesn't have some employee ownership in it. Um, it is particularly dominant in sectors of the economy which are people rich. So um, professional service businesses, engineer, engineering businesses, consultancies, marketing companies, IT companies. The built environment is very strong. So architects, engineers, construction. Um, but you'll equally see it in retail, in distribution and in healthcare. So it's popular across the board and also from very large organisations like Arup or Mott McDonald, right through to very small organisations where there's maybe only 10 or 15 or 20 people involved. So you will be probably touched by lots of employer businesses, but you might not be aware of them because arguably there, are, there aren't that many retail businesses that are employer owned. In fact, I've named the biggest one already and there are a few more that you may come across. Um, but actually, many of them sit behind in the business to business environment. The evidence for why employer ownership works is strong. We uh, conducted an inquiry in 2017 and published a report in 2018 called the Ownership Dividend. And the, the title of that report says it all, that there is a dividend to be had from employee ownership. And that dividend starts with the changes in behaviour that you see in individuals. So when somebody has a sense of ownership of their work, of, of the, the work of their colleagues, of the entity in which they spend most of their working hours, it changes their behaviour and that collective behaviour then has a dividend on the business because the performance of the business improves. So we can see through our evidence that these businesses outperform their um, peers across the piece in terms of uh, productivity, in terms of profitability. And they do that because they engage their employees, they share information more widely, they're more transparent in their dealings with employees and with customers and with suppliers. Um, and they empower individuals to actually step into the ownership responsibility. Now, of course, if we have more of these businesses in the economy, you can imagine the multiplier effect on both regional economies and also the national economy. So just to finish off, why do I think employee ownership is so important right now? Um, as we come very slowly and tentatively out of this lockdown situation and this awful economic crisis and health crisis that we've all lived through, we're now looking into some really stark realities. Two of the biggest are that there is a high degree of inequality across society and that we have very poor levels of economic resilience. So when you think about employee ownership as a means of sharing wealth more evenly through um, income and through the dispersal of bonuses and, and dividends and profits, you can see that employee ownership can really play a part in, in dealing with head on the issues of inequality. And when you look at resilience, these are businesses through that stewardship that I mentioned earlier that are really investing in the long term. And so the, this business model can also help sustain more businesses to have healthier balance sheets, more cash reserves, and ultimately to be more sustainable and to create more resilient communities. So employee ownership has never been more important than it is now. It's a great opportunity for us to see more employee ownership in the economy as we start to build back better. So thank you, Jeremy. I hope that's helped the audience with their view of um, uh, uh, what employee ownership is. Um, and I think I'm passing, passing over to David now, actually. Oh, I'm, I'll pass it back to Jeremy. Is Jeremy there or am I sorry, straight into this? So, um, as I said earlier, Bardman's uh, was set up uh, just for the two of us doing little bits of work for Beauty Children's in 1976. And, and when you're in the throes of sort of building reputation for the company you, you're running, the last thing on your mind is kind of retirement and what that might be termed your exit strategy. And I mean, your accountant may have advised you to to set up a pension plan early on, because clearly the earlier you set it up, the more it seems to earn. 
Um, and in fact, that's, that's what we did. I think a few years in, we set up a little pension plan and then we promptly forgot about it for about 40 years. A decade's passed, your hair falls out. Sadly, maybe friends that are younger than you die. Uh, life moves on. And gradually, you start thinking about life in your 70s and how the company will fare in your absence. Um, and also what it is about the company that you've loved so much that you want to carry on and what will happen to it. So you start looking around uh, for ways in which the company could be managed uh, when the founders aren't there. And you discover that the conventional options are really, well, they're really quite conventional. Um, and they don't really sit easily, certainly not, not with my belief system. I came from a rather, I suppose, left, left-leaning family where I guess people rather than money were, were classified as important. And I guess my education uh, prompted me to think in a different way um, and about how economies could be run and how companies could be structured. Um, and it's always, seemed to, it's always seemed rather odd to me that the already wealthy who could afford to buy shares in a company had first dibs over the profits of the company that they bought shares in, over and above those who'd sweated blood to produce the goods in the first place. I mean, that's a crude, crude way of putting it, but fundamentally, that's what we have in, in uh, neoliberal economics. Um, neo, you know, the economists tell us that's how, that's how companies work, that's how it should be. A company must put the shareholders first, regardless of who they are. And for me, there's, there kind of had to be a better, fairer, a more motivating way of, of uh, structuring a company. So actually, it's worth me saying at this point that Ardman didn't have a conventional formal structure for most of its life. As I say, it, it started as a partnership and it grew bit by bit over the years. I think we became a limited company when we bought the building and the land that our H quarters sit on here in the uh, Bristol Dockside. Actually, I'm not sitting in the office at the moment, I'm at home. Um, and that building actually was an old uh, five-sold banana ripening warehouse down by Bristol Docks. And I think because we then had that quite major asset, we set up a limited company then. And I guess we, as it were, you issue shares and, and Pete and I as the founders and the partners were issued those shares. And by default, we became the owners of it. I didn't, I don't, I'd never really had a sense of, oh, it's all mine. I have this great company. I mean, you sort of feel it, but I didn't have, I've never had that great sense because it was such a, a collaborative company. And we've never really had a conventional board of directors or external shareholders or even uh, a highly stratified management structure. It's always been quite flat. Um, I say it's not been a co-op, but it's always operated in a fairly democratic fashion. And in fact, we've we've nearly always um, shared profits, some of our profits with our, our workforce, who now who now call themselves partners in in the John Lewis mode. So it developed uh, a very collaborative culture uh, with a belief in trying things, giving things a go, experimenting, and actually always pushing for the best work that we could do, even if it, that really stretched the budgets to, to breaking point. And of course, celebrating success or partying, as uh, other people might call it. So some people might think that not having a formal structure was a failing uh, as our company got bigger. And actually, they might be right. I've got no idea how the company would have worked out had we had a more formal uh, board of directors and external shareholders. It would have been different. But it certainly doesn't seem to have done Ardman any harm. Um, and I would help, I would say that it's actually helped it be what it is now. Uh, which is a, a rather unconventional, internationally renowned animation company with um, currently, I think, four Oscars to its name. So uh, back to me thinking about how to set up the company uh, on the right course for success uh, way into the future when the founders retire. In 2011, I found myself listening to David Erdl um, giving a talk about a book he had just written called Beyond the Corporation, Humanity Working, which actually is this book, um, if any of you are interested in finding it, it's well worth a read. As it says on the back, it's the story of ordinary people who share the ownership of the business where they work, as it says on the back cover. Um, it was a very inspirational talk. I think it was part of the Bristol Festival of Ideas. Um, and I actually met at that same talk uh, Alistair Sorday, who, who set up 
saw those travel guides and they indeed went employee-owned a year or two before we did. I was very inspired by that talk and it set me on a trail of discovery, uh, leading me actually to take part in a backseat partnership session in I think 2011 and the talk to Deb Oxley and then and in Haxel, who were then running the Employment Ownership Association. And I think that happened in 2013. So what I found in employee ownership was an option, a, a way of effectively exiting your company, which wasn't a trade sale. A trade sale would have meant us selling to probably a fairly major media conglomerate. Um, and we would have quite quickly, I think, become an asset on a multinational's balance sheet and probably would have been traded on in a few years time or uh, or just eradicated as it probably wouldn't have been that ang that part of the company wouldn't have seemed to be maybe profitable enough and i feared that Ardman very quickly would have lost its identity uh, with a trade sale and probably a lot of its workforce i think had we sold to another company they would have looked at our back catalog and the character that we've developed and they would have said actually we can outsource this animation make it much more cost effectively, do it in CGI and we'll make it in Singapore or Canada. And actually the workforce would have been set to one side. They would have retained maybe the name, they certainly would have retained the character brands, but that's it. The, the whole ethics and the culture of the company would have gone. And I suspect probably in less than seven years, probably around about the five year mark, I think it would have disappeared. And of course, we've seen this happen with other companies. I mean, the, not a media company, but I think it was, uh, you know, Green and Blacks of Chocolate People, Salted Cadbury's, on the understanding that they would retain their brand and they Cadbury's promptly sold to Kraft and um, everything changed. So uh, the other alternative would be a, a management buyout, uh, which, you know, the, the senior managers or, or the board uh, raise the funds to buy the owners out. Um, and that's, that can be quite a good model. It tends to land those people with quite a lot of debt to pay off. And some are successful, some aren't as successful. Ben could probably talk about the pros and cons of that model later. Um, but we probably would have made the, what we what were the senior managers, they probably would have had to put their houses on, on in hock, as it were, uh, to cover the liability of the debts they were raising. And I don't know whether they would have wanted to do that or whether we would have allowed them to do that, to take that risk. So the EO option seemed to provide actually a very good answer to the issue of succession. And uh, having done that research, I then laid out the idea to Pete, Peter Lord and our financial director. And I think that was in 2013. And they did more research and I attended more EOA events, particularly a couple of conferences that they hold um, they hold an annual conference every November, which are, which are really interesting. And that was really to get my head around the whole thing and understand what the various models were and the pros and cons of those. And I have to say, and I think it's one of the issues that we have, is that our accountants, who are quite a big company, actually, they shall re remain nameless, uh, didn't know much about employee ownership and were probably a little bit perplexed and possibly a little bit sceptical about the idea They've, they've bought into it very well now, um, which is great. And I think it will be interesting to see whether they um, see it as a good option for other companies that they're dealing with on their books. The good news was that our lawyers at TLT, who we've been working with for many, many years, uh, did have somebody who was engaging with the movement and has become quite an expert on the subject now. And of course, that is Ben Watson, who's, who's with us today. Um, so Pete and I overall, we, we agreed that it'd be a good way forward and we got our first valuation of the company, I think in 2016, and engaged an EO consultant to help us navigate through the process because there is, there is a lot to be done. Um, there's a big, big shopping list that you end up writing. Uh, and um, I have to say that those EO consultants was actually uh, Gad Associates with, with Jeremy in the pole position again, who's with us today. And I think we signed with them in October 2016. And I do have to say that without that team, without Jeremy and Ben, uh, it would have taken us probably longer and would have been a great deal more difficult to navigate. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a difficult process. 
And I remember, but I remember somebody saying at a, a regional EO meeting that you need to have somebody dedicated to uh, probably a day, uh, certainly a day a week, if not more, uh, in the run up to the transition to date, because there is a lot of work and you don't want to take your eye off the ball. And I was, you know, MD of Ardman and doing bits of filming work as well. And actually having those two on board, um, cracking the whip was a great help. So we realized that it would probably take, a, we, yeah, we'd allow ourselves about a year to do all the nitty gritty stuff. Um, and that's, there's a lot of communications with the staff. I think by that point, our payroll full time was probably about 140, 150. And of course, the same again, uh, with a large freelance contingent who are animators, model makers, bloody cameramen, all those craft grades. A lot of those craft grades tend to be freelancers and we wanted to include them in the process as well. So there's a lot of work to do with getting people to understand what we were doing, what their thoughts might be. So you drew, you, we drew up a, a, a long sort of action list. I mean, it's a huge sort of A2 size spreadsheet, which looks pretty daunting uh, to begin with. And gradually you just start working through it. We set up a small team, our FT, our head of HR, myself, my assistant, uh, and Jeremy and Ben, and just kind of went through these, you know, the, the, the list, uh, and obviously including other people as was necessary. And we, we pretty well hit our deadline. Uh, the transition day was November the 5th, 2018, uh, which as Jeremy said, is about 18 months ago, uh, coming up to two years in November. And the model that we set up was the John Lewis partnership model. It's a trust. Uh, there aren't direct shares held by uh, the partners. They're held in trust for them by a, uh, by a trust. And one of the reasons for doing that was that it allowed us to incorporate the freelancers, both as reps and indeed uh, profit share people, without having to have effectively shareholders outside the company. So if we were going to include the, sh the freelancers in, the, in a direct scheme, they would have had to have shares themselves. And that's where you end up with almost going back to a conventional model where you have external shareholders uh, who aren't actually full-time part of the company. So the trust model uh, has worked very well. We have a small trust. Uh, one of our esteemed uh, ex-staff members who was our general manager for a long time is on that trust. Um, and we have a lawyer, me, and a uh, financial director and, and, a call, uh, and an employee rep trust trustee as well. So I think that's five or six of us in all. And they liaise with and meet uh, the new MD um, and basically hold the MD to account to make sure that the values uh, and the principles that Pete and I set out in what is actually this document um, are held to and the company is run really in the interests of the partners. Uh, it's gone very well actually so far and I would definitely say that during this COVID-19 crisis being employee-owned has certainly helped them solve a lot of the problems. I think that collaborative spirit, uh, the understanding that's in the partner's interest to get things right to both protect themselves and indeed their company and to get productions up and running um, so being, you know, an EO company has helped massively, I think, with uh, sorting out solutions with the crisis. So uh, I'm pleased to say that the studios uh, are back up and running. We're shooting a morph series. We're shooting a Christmas special uh, for Netflix at our bigger studio. Uh, they're now back in and shooting. The CGI work and the digital work actually never stopped, uh, although a lot of people were working from home. Uh, the IT guys set up a very, very effective uh, pipeline for them. So that work has carried on almost seamlessly from from um, the middle of March. So, so far, so far, so good. So that's a brief history. I haven't gone into uh, the fine detail of exactly how I went about it and the issues you hit. There's probably a book in that, to be honest. Uh, but I'm very welcome, uh, very happy to take your questions. So thank you. Thank you.
David, thank you very much. And Deb, thank you as well. Um, I hope everybody got most of that. We had a couple of technical issues, but hopefully you've got the, the, the gist of what's been, uh, what we've been discussing. Um, so I invite all the panel now to, to rejoin us. So thank you. I can see the panel, which is great. Um, please feel free to start submitting your questions. But just to get us going, a couple of things that really came through clearly. I was mentioned a few times. Um, one was about the power of ownership. And, and clearly in today's world, where people are looking at, you know, the, the, having a voice and the ability to influence and to be heard. Um, how does the sort of ownership model of employee ownership, how does the power really manifest itself? What sort of power do people have? And then um, perhaps, um, Deb, if you could start that off and, and, and David come in from, well, you, you mentioned a little bit about how it works within Ardman, but also, Ben, whether there's sort of legal um, elements that can be written in that, that, that give people power. So if we could start off with power and then I want to move on to the sort of the finance side and how you finance this and, and, and how the bank finance this. So, Deb, could, could you start off from the power perspective, please? Yeah, definitely. Um... So I think it's a really interesting place to start because um, I'm often asked when uh, people think about employee-owned businesses, they they seem to jump from ownership to uh, management and leadership and, and slightly get confused and think that that means that if it's owned by the employees, that means the business itself must be run by everybody. So everybody's involved in every decision, which, of course, isn't the case. So um, in employment businesses, there are the same hierarchies and structures that you will see in every other business. There'll be a board of directors, there'll be senior managers, there'll be accountability and performance management in exactly the same way. However, the power, as you described it, Jeremy, is, is in the ability to influence at key strategic moments and to have an opportunity to have opinions shared when it's important to have it shared. And so dependent on the, the structure that's in place, um, of course, all of this varies in each business, but what you tend to get is, uh, and David referred to this, you know, there's a trust and you'll have one or two elected directors on there and they are acting in the in best interest of the business. As the, as the trustees that owns the sum or all of the equity. And then you've got the employees who might be coalesced around a, an employee forum or a council. And, and traditionally, you'll see them being asked their views at key strategic moments. So if there's an acquisition about to take place or the business is considering a change of direction or some new products or an investment, it's very common for the, the management to reach out to the employees to ask their views, opinions, concerns. Can they see any implications of that? But the day-to-day -day operational decision-making happens in exactly the same way you'd expect in any other business. And I get the sense that although the ownership and power is, is important, that actually it's the, uh, the purpose and culture that comes through from many of the organisations that they've really got it. It's not as if they're having a complete change overnight. Actually, that's already embedded within the organisation. I, I, and I think you're right. I think go back to what David was talking about and his very personal account of why a management buyout and a trade sale wasn't right for Ardman. Um, whilst many employer and businesses at this moment in time um, are possibly not B Corps, some of them are, where they've got purpose enshrined in their articles, many of the founder owners are just like David and Peter and they have very clear principles around what good business looks like for them. So um, they, that, um, that legacy that they bring to the business then permeates through the, the employee ownership structure as well. But of course, some of them do then, now the B Corp model is, is available, um, you, we are starting to see um, employer businesses look at becoming a B Corp as well so that they can, they can bring purpose and employee ownership together. I would add, Jeremy, that I think that that when you're looking at the trustee board, for instance, which, as Deb says, is there to say, well, we own the majority of the shares now in the company and we hold those shares on behalf of all employees, then it, it's that is normally represented by somebody from management, maybe an independent, and they, as, in, as in Ardman's case, 
but often with a group of employees as well. They've been selected by ballot across the, the business. And I know in, in Ardman's case, they've been very careful about that selection to make sure that each part of the business is enfranchised across the employee council um, and the trustee board. Um, I think I think that sometimes people see a challenge as, OK, this trustee board has got to hold the managing director to account. And that is difficult sometimes when you're an employee. So it's, it's always a, a growing piece in that as employees get used to being trustees, um, they learn more and more about what that role might entail um, and how that governance is going to work out. And that's sometimes why you see as well independent people sat on the trustee board to help the employees and the co-owners just ask some challenging questions of the managing director and the finance director and to work through some of those uh, things that at the beginning at least might, might be, be slightly difficult. I think the other thing to mention is, is uh, we talked about employee forums, employee councils, and I always see those as that that's really the living, breathing centre of an employee-owned company, particularly in larger employee-owned companies, because they're really listening and understanding the views of the co-owners on the ground. You know, what can we do better? What, 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 what are things that we should change? But also filtering out stuff so that the executive board gets a good picture of a streamlined number of requests in terms of what could change, not thousands of ideas every minute because the exec board that's running the company has got a lot to do. Um, so these tend to be living, breathing things that need, that need work. Um, and that is one of the reasons why the communities that the EOA uh, sponsors so well around the country in terms of regional networks are so helpful because it means employees from all sorts of employee-owned businesses can get together and say, what works in your business? How, how do you deal with governance and share ideas, which is always going to make the model stronger. And sorry, just was, I, asked, I was asked on the uh, chat box too. So this and is a book it, for those of you that want it, David Erdahl's Beyond the Corporation. Um, and I think to reinforce Ben's point, uh, we, we have a partner representative for about every 30 people um, in 10 distinct constituencies, which are, are occupational. So it might be model making, might be animation, might be producers, might be marketing very broadly around that. Um, with those reps and with others, we set up a series of task force to look at things like, you know, uh, gender, uh, uh, gender equality on pay, um, mental health, well-being, particularly during the COVID thing, a whole bundle of small task force, which then dig into what the issues are. Um, and that proved a very, very uh, effective way of dealing with quite tricky problems often, uh, because you've got more voices, you've got people that are committed to spending of maybe a few hours a month looking at the issue and being able to talk amongst themselves and bring those back um, to the exec board. Um, and it can't be understated as ever when you ask, the, as it were, the people on the shop floor what their thoughts are they'll come up and it's quite, quite funny because the first uh the first partner rep group which i hosted because i was obviously still md before i held on for a year before whilst we found another md and i remember thinking there's going to be one hell of a list of what will effectively be complaints coming through from the partner rep group and i thought yeah there'll be this big wave and actually, a lot of them will deal with really quite quickly because a lot of them will be fairly moderately trivial. And there'll be half a dozen or so which will need some serious work and will take some months. And that's pretty well exactly what happened. A whole bundle of things that we can deal with really quite quickly. And then these bigger issues, the bigger, more strategic issues, um, like, you know, uh, the pay rates and all that kind of stuff would take much longer to work through. But it's been a... And, you know, what you discover is these people, have a, they have a great voice, they are articulate, they've thought hard about it, they're very concerned about it because they've always felt very much part of the company anyway, and this has given them a real, real voice. But as Deb says, we still have, you know, there's an executive board um, alongside the trust now. So we have actually, when you look at the structure, it actually looks more uh, conventional than it did before your EO, but it operates in a very different way to a conventionally structured shareholder company. And before we go on to, to the finance, I'm curious. I think what 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 has been listening, interesting listening to that, uh, from certainly from from Deb and from Ben, is the kind of the practical ways, the theory, the how it works. Actually, Dave, my sense is 
was it quite a big change from you being the omnipotent dictator, for one, excuse the, uh, the judgment, but, um, you know, all, all seeing owner of a business to suddenly being held to account? Oh, I mean, actually, because of the way we had structured that? it, our, our, our executive board, yeah, they were effectively our senior managers. We actually turned them into directors of the company. A lot of them have been with us a long time. There's always been a lot of feedback. They, they were, in a way, the they had more power effectively than I did in many ways. Um, and as you know, Jeremy, I'm not a, I'm not a, a massive dictator uh, in the way I operate. So that collaborative culture, uh, that's kind of been there. I remember thinking when all this came up, I thought, actually, we're probably about 70% of the way there already, even though we're not formally structured like this. The way our companies operate and the way you take soundings and the way we've always well, you know, talked about things and talked things through. And part of that comes out of sort of filmmaking culture. Filmmaking is a huge sort of team game. Yes, you have a director who's, who's, who's got the idea and may or may not have the story, the narrative. But boy, that person needs a huge amount of people as a support team with very high level skills, all of whom want to make that film as good as it can be. So we're pulling in that same direction under what is a, a, a structure with a theoretically a, a, a direct a leader. Uh, and I think that sort of culture permeated through the way we structured the actual business. Um, so it wasn't a huge, in many ways, I suppose it was uh, a little bit more of a relief. Ah, oh, actually, you, you can now officially say, look, come on, let's get our heads together. Let's work this out collaboratively rather than, look, guys, what, what do we do here? Um, give us a help, you know. So it wasn't a massive. It wasn't a massive change from my point of view. I don't know whether others would have regarded it as a big change. I think. I think a lot of them found getting their heads around what it meant. I remember one of our seniors saying, "Well, so we don't really own any shares. So how does that work out as ownership?" And that was something we had to talk through with them what it meant in terms of the way the thing was structured. So I, I want to come back to culture in a minute. It's interesting you said you had the culture sort of 70% there and, and we'll come back to whether you need to get the culture there first before you come EO or EO help shapes your culture particularly building on what Deb said from a kind of B Corp perspective and, and having that purpose but but firstly I think the finance piece because I, I, I sense that it's quite interesting or it's important to understand actually you know how do you finance a transition uh, into employee ownership and, and kind of what the what the alternatives are. Um, Simon are you happy to sort of pick up on, on some of that for us and to start this conversation? Simon, I think you might be on mute. New age problem. You're on mute. Um, so, yeah, so one of the things that I guess are the projects that we've seen come through and, and we've supported and, and coming through the pipeline as we are today, um, because it's obviously pretty popular at the minute and obviously part of this build back better consideration as well, is that there's, a, if you like, a mix of, of, of capital and, and, and potentially um, sales um, maybe not achieving the full trade value if it was really stretched out and, and prettied up as a business and as an organization that the um, the in-house sale is is more a, a, a realistic value maybe um, of the business. So there's, there's that on the positive side when a bank is looking at that, but also more often than not, the, the owners, the, the, the originators of that equity, um, if you like being patient with their capital, I mean, because they're, you know, Quite often, this succession, it's a passion, their business and their organization. And if you like passing that on, that they're more patient with their capital in terms of when and how they want it out um, that can support the business. And, and we see a number of cases where actually there is no requirement for a bank to come in with facilities. Uh, but conversely, um, we obviously look at the impact first and the principle behind the lending, but as, as long as it's at least neutral in terms of the environment as sustainability as an organization, as with many professional organizations, we'll, we'll take a look at the, the financing of that um, over a period of time, typically over five years, um, is the kind of support that we've provided to date. So occasionally longer, we've, looked, we've provided one. No, actually, it's not quite there yet in terms of but I think it's out of 10 to 15 years, but there's actually some physical property involved in that, which may be a bit unusual for the majority of uh, um, if you like transitions to employee ownership. But one of the big things, it's funny, you talk about money and we always get interested in straight into money, but actually in terms of financing, that 
culture and the depth and and if you like the, the that actually there's a transition of people the management capability and the culture that's transferring if you like from the original owners through into the new organization actually gives as much um, confidence in a project as the numbers in many ways um, because I think if if somebody was um, just doing delivering the transaction without without any thought or care for it I think that you know could bring problems and uh, and, and I think I do think it is interesting in terms of that idea that you because you're you're an owner particularly in you know I can think of Riverford Guy Watson you know a, a single owner effectively of a business literally becoming an, an employee owner the next day on the 8th of June 2018 that was um, and, and it, it takes some doing I think from being the ultimate decision maker and responsible people look to to the next day being one of many thank you and and um david from from uh your model and your perspective um how how was your transition if you're happy to share how was your transition finance was, well were, were because banks involved it, or how, how did we've that been looking work? at this for some years probably seven seven years in total and part of that was to do with uh it doesn't need you know when i started looking at it i realized it, it, it doesn't need to happen tomorrow because actually i'm still fairly young and not yet uh, ready. So, so we managed to build up a bit of a nest egg. We did it rather unconventional way. And in fact, an accountant would probably say, hang on, you gave yourself money that you already owned, um, which to an extent is true. We'd built up a nest egg. One of the things that we were concerned about was, because you have a valuation, and I think, I think with Guy, and I think with um, Richard Sounds, and indeed ourselves, there's a valuation of the company. And then there's actually, well, how much, how much do you need? Um, and how much do you want to, you know, uh, put the company through financial risk by risking its cash flow, or whatever? And then when you under, when you sort of understand actually, you, how many how many ocean going yachts do you actually operate at any one time? Kind of thing, or how many pairs? You know, there's a number which actually I'd, I'd be happy with that. That's fine. And actually, it's probably considerably less than the valuation of the company. In fact, I was looking at our valuation the other day. Um, and probably we discounted it probably at least at least 30 percent i would say in terms of what pete and i took out of it um and part of that was actually that's fine we're happy with that that that's great don't need any more that's fine and part of it was let's not lumber the company with a lot of debt in what is although it has quite a high turnover it doesn't make millions and millions of pounds every year um it fluctuates quite a lot and i was concerned that we didn't want to um stress the company too much financially and what was a transition and what was also a very volatile time in the in the industry and as simon says there are various ways you can do it um but i say the valuation isn't necessarily the price you've got to pay depending on the philanthropy of of the owners i don't know whether ben's got anything to say on that uh, Thank you. Uh, oh, well, I, I think you're absolutely right, David. I, mean, I, th I think each company tends to look at it slightly differently, um, dependent on the size and shape of the company and dependent slightly on the outlook of the individuals involved. And as you say, I think it, it's like any sensible financial planning, isn't it? People tend to start it looking from, OK, what do they want to uh, take out or what do they need to take out? And that it has to be seen to a certain extent through that prism and that. Uh, and that, and that gives you an indicator of where you might end up. Um, and the key criteria, again, as you say quite rightly, is really that the, you know, the, the, the trustee cannot obviously pay more for the business than it's worth. So you need to have that independent valuation there to underpin any decisions you're, 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 you're making. And, and other interested parties like, like HM Revenue and Customs, of course, want to see that people are selling shares for uh, a price that is market value or, or, or less and not Fair value yeah. yeah 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 so yeah we see yeah the patient capital pieces that we see is, is more often so, that so fair the, value hmrc piece is is important and so but the idea that actually if you like the the, the seller can be you know take money out over a period of time in the initial agreement and and therefore you can marry up alongside it bank lending if required or or cash just cash flow as the business generates income and hopefully the, the employees take it to the next level i think one of the important points 
I mentioned is probably, and Deb, you might echo this, just in terms of how employee ownership has grown over the last decade, I guess we would say that in recent years, you know, with the likes of Trios and others, that the financing um, opportunities have probably broadened from what they were five, perhaps eight, eight years ago, where the model was was perhaps seen as so unusual that um, it was a little bit difficult to get it um, through the, the, the various lending committees that you, you might have to. And I think that's changed quite markedly, actually, um, for the reasons I just said I, over the last few years. And, and, and you know, there are uh, opportunities for finance available with this model that, 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 that would be available and the sort of more what, what would have been seen as the sort of more traditional routes of, of MBO or, um, or, or other uh, management buyout financed vehicles in, in, in historically yeah I, th I think i think you're both right i think there's been a maturing of the market i think we've still got somewhere to go though before all banks across all areas of each bank are, are universally accepting and willing to have the conversation because there's a high level of inconsistency still across the major banks in terms of their response and also, you know, at the moment, what we're seeing the growth, it's around succession planning. But there is a, an equally, I think, big opportunity around uh, scale up and growth for, of, of SMEs that where employee ownership could play its role. And that, that in itself um, is another form of lending, you know, where this is about investment to grow. And so I think having a flexible sort of smorgasbord, if you like, of finance that's available is really important because every business is different and every business will want something different. And we know that SMEs tend to be more risk averse, so they're not looking at external finance. So what we need are the types of lenders that Simon's you know, been talking about, where there's a more patient view of capital that is you know, based on the values and the purpose of the business so that it can match the aspirations of the business. Because um, we know that these businesses are not in it for the short term. They're in it for long-term value creation, not short-term profit realisation. And, and therefore, it needs a, a finance partner who can who can match those expectations. And I think this is why the, the employee ownership structure does work particularly well, for succession at least, because it allows an owner to plan their exit on their terms rather than a trade sale, which may have them see them leave the business really quickly, which can be catastrophic for the business if all of that intellect and knowledge is taken away too quickly before the management team are ready to step up. So that's why I think this it's a patient exit and it needs patient capital to go with it. And there's no reason why most businesses shouldn't be looking at lenders. They don't have to just take deferred payments, which can extend the period that the founder owners stay involved, which there's a balance. You know, you don't want people, no disrespect to David and Peter, but you don't want people who have set up the business to be staying all up around forever because they then can potentially hold back the ambition and the new ideas of the of the new management team. But you do need them there for the right amount of time to do that careful handholding that is so essential to the to the sustainability. And so you need to find a finance partner who's willing to support that and, and not to overlook that growth opportunity that, that you know, SMEs are not particularly um, um, necessarily renowned for looking for investment um, to scale up. But, and that's because they're concerned about taking on private equity, for example, and worry about the direction of the business. But actually, if you can do something like this midterm in the, you know, as midway through a business's lifespan, then actually this would be a great way of stimulating and injecting some cash into the business potentially um, that can help it grow as well and some new energy from the employee owners. Yeah, that'll be interesting in in the next uh, period of time, I guess, in the, in this COVID and, and all the change we're going through right now is that certainly the businesses and projects that we've seen, they've taken that extended period, the Riverford in, in a bit like Hardman, in terms of a lot of looking at it before the actual transition then a period of transition. But we're possibly talking about businesses now that maybe six months ago didn't actually know that this was the way for them. And actually, there could be a much quicker transition. So that'll be a, an interesting phase to go through um, and for us to learn about and from as we go along. So whether mm. you've got any thoughts about whether organisations are going to start up straight into employee ownership? Well, it's an interesting one. 
we, we don't get many inquiries um, about Guys. startups. And to be honest, um, we've got a very close working relationship with Cooperatives UK and we will normally um, actually make introductions to Co-ops UK for worker co-ops because they tend to be quite small organisations to start with. Um, so we've, we're seeing most of the inquiries coming at the point of succession. And as I say, latterly, some more coming around growth planning. Guys, I'm really sorry, but our time is up. That was just shows how how uh, how fascinating this is. I can't believe we've had an hour already. Um, Deb from the EOA, thank you so much for explaining what this is and sharing uh, very passionately why employee ownership matters so much at the moment and about Build Back Better. Dave for sharing your story and for Ben and Simon for... I think one of us might need to do a bit of a roundup on behalf of Jeremy because I think we've lost I think he was saying thank you to Ben, Simon, David, and myself, but we should thank Jeremy as well for trying to hold it all together. I think we've, we've suffered a little bit from the technology gremlins today at Stair to Action, but um, I hope everybody's enjoyed it. Um, I think we've all enjoyed participating. So um, I think we're just before our time now, aren't we? Um, no doubt we'll be getting the um, two second warning from the organizers. But um, hopefully everybody's enjoyed it. So um, thanks to the organisers for inviting us. Thanks all. Thanks, Deb. Yep, thank you all. Thanks for attending. Yep, thank you very much.